Chapter 5, Moses wrote of me, Moses a great man and prophet, no other person's life has paralleled the life of Jesus Christ more than that of the prophet Moses. For the tribes of Israel, his life and words became an introduction to the law and life of Jesus Christ. From within the scriptures he has been given more references than any other pre-Christian man. His writings consist of one-fourth of all the books of the Old Testament, and they all point to the great Messiah, who was to be like unto Moses. Moses has gained the respect and honor of nearly every nation in the world, and his name is honored by more people than that of Jesus. The three great religions Christian, Jewish and Mohammedan all, revere Moses as the outstanding leader, lawgiver and prophet of the pre-Christian era. His main contribution was delivering a nation from slavery, moving them into a new land through impossible obstacles, and then establishing a law among them, which has been a source of principle for every major civilization in the world for 3,500 years. Through divine guidance and protection, Moses miraculously liberated a nation that had weltered in temporal and spiritual bondage. As a spiritual instrument for God, he manifest a power of greatness that changed the course of history for all the house of Israel leading three million people from Sinai to Kaddish and then into the Transjordanic kingdoms, and providing all their needs was certainly a major accomplishment. Picture of a cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. Aside from various accompanying miracles, the transplanting of a whole great nation, bodily, from one land to another, meanwhile maintaining it 40 years in a desert, was in itself one of the most stupendous miracles of the ages. Haley's Bible Handbook, page 145. Moses was known by the apostles of Jesus as a man who was mighty in words and deeds. He was also learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, Acts 7:22, and as a prince was in a position to become the king of all Egypt, yet he chose to suffer the difficulties of life with his people in the faith of their father's God. So, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, Heb. 11, 25, he fulfilled a mission that heralded the life and mission of Jesus Christ. The life of Moses was a parallel to that of the Savior in many ways. His teachings exemplified the gospel of Christ, and the laws he administered were introductory to the laws of Christianity. These parallels serve as an illustration and shadow of the life and ministry of Christ. First, Moses was leading the people from bondage and sin into a new freedom and a land of promise. Christ came to lead men from the slavery of sin and error to the eternal mansions of heaven. While Moses brought them from the spiritual darkness of Egypt, Christ became the light that was to light at every soul forever. The life of Moses had been foretold by prophets before he was born, Gen. 5029 IV, and so had the life of the Savior. Both had been appointed a time and place to be born, and were given a special mission to perform. The birth of both Moses and Christ caused the jealousy of the ruler of their nation. The Pharaoh pronounced a death sentence upon Moses, and Herod did the same to Christ. The satanical zeal of both rulers ordered the killing of all male children to satisfy their jealous rage, said Pharaoh. Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. X. 122. Herod slew all the male children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under. Matt. 2.16. Egypt was the land involved in their birth, for the mother of Moses, worried about getting her son out of Egypt away from the Pharaoh, while Mary had to take her son to Egypt to avoid the wrath of Herod. Although Moses was in a position to become a king over all of Egypt and Israel, and Christ was born as king of the Jews and of all the world both honors were rejected, and their lives were sought after. When Moses went up into the wilderness of the mountain to speak with God, he fasted forty days, x. 34-28. And when Jesus went into the wilderness, he also fasted forty days. Matt. 4-2. When Moses went into the wilderness, he spoke to God mouth to mouth, Num. 12-8, as Jesus did, and then the devil appeared to him to tempt him, Moses 1-18-22, just as he did to Jesus. Matt. 4-3. These marvelous manifestations prove that Moses was indeed a spiritual giant. The Miracles of Moses Moses performed over 20 outstanding miracles. These were evidences of the power that God had entrusted to him. They were manifest to the children of Israel with such force that there was little doubt as to God's calling of Moses. Miracles by Jesus were one of the most convincing proofs that he was the promised Savior. When Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews came to Jesus, he said, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. John 3 2. 
When Moses performed the miracle of turning water into blood, X, 719, it was comparable to the miracle that Jesus performed by turning water into wine, John 2 9, and, when Moses manifests divine powers over the Red Sea, X, 1421, Jesus exhibited similar powers by quelling the storm on the Sea of Galilee, Luke 8 24. Again, when the Israelites were starving for food, the miracle of manna bread, X, 1615, was contrasted to the multiplication of five loaves to feed the 5,000, and the seven loaves to feed another 4,000, Matt, 16 9-10. The manna bread came down from the heavens to preserve the life of the Israelites, Jesus likened himself to that bread, when the people questioned him saying, What sign shewest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger. John 6 30-35. Then, as the children of Israel marched through the wilderness, they thirsted. God provided water from a rock by miraculous powers at Massa, X, 17 6, and again at Meribah, Num, 21-13. Dot, 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 the people thirsted, dot, dot, and murmured against Moses, saying back quote, W, H, E, R, E, F, O, R, E, is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Back quote, w, H, A, T, shall I do, cried Moses unto the Lord, back quote, U, N, T, O, this people, they be almost ready to stone me, X, 17 3, 4. The Lord's reply was that Moses was to take with him of the elders of Israel and his rod, and come up to the rock called Horeb, and smite the rock upon which the Lord, it was stated, would stand. The promise was that as Moses struck the rock, waters would gush forth that the people might drink. And so it came to pass, the cry of the people had been back quote, I s the Lord among us, or not? What more proof could be demanded? A frowning, impenetrable rock, smitten by a frail rod only to burst asunder with a mighty stream of water, fresh and pure, gushing forth for the famished multitudes to drink until they could drink no more. It was wrought, we read, in the sight of the elders. No picture in the Old Testament foreshadowings of the coming Messiah has appealed more to the hearts of Christians, eager as they are for unveilings of the glory of Christ, than the smitten rock of Horeb. It has been immortalized by Top Lady's famous hymn, enshrined in the very heart of Christendom, backquote, R, O, C, K, of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed, be of sin the double cure, save from wrath, and make me pure. The thought is so outstanding in the scriptures that one cannot escape it. It all points to the same astounding fact, namely, that in the cross of Christ healing streams of eternal life flow forth for all mankind. Cross through the scriptures, page 35 to 36. Paul the Apostle aptly made the comparison by writing. All our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. I Cor. 10 1-4 Jesus first taught this to be true by declaring that if any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink. John 7 37 and Rev. 22 17. Jesus became the living water and bread to all who would accept him. The commemorative ceremonies, comparable to the miracles of Moses were the ordinances and celebrations which pointed to the promised Messiah. The most holy and revered possession in Israel was the Holy of Holies. It was a cube containing the Ark of the Covenant, representing God's dwelling place, and was entered once a year by the high priest. The Ark was, a chest 3 3 fourths feet long, 2 1 fourth feet wide, 2 1 fourth feet high, made of acacia wood, overlaid with pure gold. It contained the two tables of the Ten Commandments, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod. The mercy seat was the top of the ark, a lid of solid gold, a cherub at each end, of one piece with the lid facing each other, their wings spread out, looking down toward the mercy seat. The mercy seat being just above the two tables of the Ten Commandments represented the meeting place of law and mercy, thus, a shadow of Christ. Haley's Bible Handbook, page 129. This Holy of Holies was entered on the Day of Atonement. Now the Day of Atonement was a national holiday, or Holy Day the most solemn day in all Israel. It was the only day in the Mosaic Law which had to be observed, and was observed as a special Sabbath. It was instituted for the removal of sin from Israel for the period of one year. 
On this occasion only the high priest was permitted to enter into the Holy of Holiest. Having bathed his person and dressed himself entirely in the holy white linen garments, he brought forward a young bullock for a sin offering purchased at his own cost, on account of himself and his family, and two young goats for a sin offering, with a ram for a burnt offering, which were paid for out of the public treasury, on account of the people. He then presented the two goats before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle, and cast lots upon them. On one lot for Jehovah was inscribed, and on the other for Azazel a phrase of unusual difficulty. The best modern Modern scholars agree that it designates the personal being to whom the goat was sent, probably Satan. This goat was called the scapegoat. After various sacrifices and ceremonies the goat upon which the lot for Jehovah had fallen was slain, and the high priest sprinkled its blood before the mercy seed, in the same manner as he had done that of the bullock. Going out from the holy of holies, he purified the holy place, sprinkling some of the blood of both the victims on the altar of incense. At this time no one besides the high priest was suffered to be present in the holy place. The purification of the holy of holies and of the holy place being thus completed, the high priest laid his hands upon the head of the goat on which the lot for Azazel had fallen, and confessed over it all the sins of the people. The goat was then led, by a man chosen for the purpose, into the wilderness, into a land not inhabited, and was there let loose. The high priest after this returned into the holy place, bathed himself again, put on his usual garments of office, and offered the two rams as burnt offerings, one for himself and one for the people. In considering the meaning of the particular rites of the day, three points appear to be of a very distinctive character. 1. The white garments of the high priest. 2. His entrance into the holy of holiest. 3. The scapegoat. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, Heb, 9 7-25, teaches us to apply the first two particulars. The high priest himself, with his person cleansed and dressed in white garments, was the best outward type which a living man could present in his own person of that pure and holy one who was to purify his people, and to cleanse them from their sins. If we keep in view that the two goats are spoken of as parts of one and the same sin offering, we shall not have much difficulty in seeing that they form together, but one symbolical expression, the slain goat setting forth the act of sacrifice, in giving up its own life for others to Jehovah, and the goat which carried off its load of sin for complete removal, signifying the cleansing influence of faith in that sacrifice. Smith's Bible Dictionary, page 65-66. to Aaron had been instructed to take two goats, and lots were cast over the two. The goat upon which the lot was chosen was to be the scapegoat for Israel. The sins of the people were placed upon the goat, and it was turned out of the gate of the camp, and the sins were to be forgotten and forgiven of the people. Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness, Lev. 1621-22. The act of placing the sins of Israel upon a goat and sending it without the camp, was exemplified by Paul the Apostle, when he wrote that, the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his blood, suffered without the gate. Heb. 13 11, 12. Another celebration observed by Israel was the Passover. It was commemorated for Israel's miraculous deliverance from the bondage of sin. Being saved by the blood of a lamb was a pattern of being saved by the blood of the Lamb of God. X. 12 7, and Matt. 26 28, and Paul said that Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. I Cor. 5 7. This feast Passover was instituted by God to commemorate the deliverance of the Israelites from Egyptian bondage and the sparing of their firstborn. When the destroying angel smote the firstborn of the Egyptians, the deliverance from Egypt was regarded as the starting point of the Hebrew nation. The Israelites were then raised from the condition of bondmen under a foreign tyrant to that of a free people owing allegiance to no one but Jehovah. The prophet in a later age spoke of the event as a creation and a redemption of the nation. God declares himself to be the creator of Israel. The Exodus was thus looked upon as the birth of the nation, the Passover was its annual birthday feast. It was the yearly memorial of the dedication of the people to him who had saved their firstborn from the destroyer in order that they might be made holy to himself. The Passover was not only commemorative but also typical. Backquote, the deliverance which it commemorated was a type of the great salvation it foretold. No other shadow of good things to come contained in the law, 
can be with the festival of the Passover in expressiveness and completeness, one, the Paschal Lamb must, of course, be regarded as the leading feature in the ceremonial of the festival. The Lamb slain typified Christ the backquote, L A M B of God slain for the sins of the world, Christ backquote, O U R Passover is sacrifice for us, I core. 5 7, according to the divine purpose, the true Lamb of God was slain at nearly the same time as backquote, T H E Lord's Passover at the same season of the year, and at the same time of the day, as the daily sacrifice at the temple. The crucifixion beginning at the hour of the morning sacrifice and ending at the hour of the evening sacrifice, that the lamb was to be roasted and not boiled, has been supposed to commemorate the haste of the departure of the Israelites. It is not difficult to determine the reason of the command backquote N-O-T, a bone of him shall be broken. The Lamb was to be a symbol of unity the unity of the family, the unity of the nation, the unity of God with His people whom He had taken into covenant with Himself. 2. The unleavened bread ranks next in importance to the Paschal Lamb. We are warranted in concluding that unleavened bread had a peculiar sacrificial character, according to the law. It seems more reasonable to accept St. Paul's reference to the subject, Icor, 5 6 to 8, as furnishing the true meaning of the symbol. Fermentation is decomposition, a dissolution of unity. The pure dry biscuit would be an apt emblem of unchanged duration, and, in its freedom from foreign mixture, of purity also. 3. The offering of the omer or first sheaf of the harvest, Lev, 23 10 14, signify deliverance from winter, the bondage of Egypt being well considered as a winter in the history of the nation. 4. The consecration of the first fruits, the firstborn of the soil, is an easy type of the consecration of the firstborn of the Israelites, and of our own best selves, to God. Further than this, 1. The Passover is a type of deliverance from the slavery of sin. 2. It is the passing over of the doom we deserve for our sins, because the blood of Christ has been applied to us by faith. 3. The sprinkling of the blood upon the doorposts was a symbol of open confession of our allegiance and love. 4. The Passover was useless unless eaten, so we live upon the Lord Jesus Christ. 5. It was eaten with bitter herbs, as we must eat our Passover with the bitter herbs of repentance and confession, which yet, like the bitter herbs of the Passover, are a fitting and natural accompaniment. 6. As the Israelites ate the Passover all prepared for the journey, so do we with a readiness and desire to enter the active service of Christ and to go on the journey toward heaven. Smith's Bible Dictionary page 485 to 486. The Law and Commandments. God's introduction to His commandments came by thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet, exceeding loud, so that all of the people that were in the camp trembled. X. 1916. The Creator of the earth descended upon Mount Sinai to give Moses the Ten Commandments. Mightier than the parting of the sea, the miracles of manna bread, or the plagues upon Egypt, was God's establishing His law to His servant Moses. The commandments were given to Israel to help them overcome their struggle against idolatry, and to prepare them for the higher law that would come through Christ. Moses was the mediator of the first law as Jesus was to be the mediator for the second, Hab. 3 1-19. Of the Ten Commandments, four were in reverence to God and the other six in respect for man. These commandments were so spiritual and everlasting in their nature, that when Christ came he said that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Matt. 5:17. Jesus condensed the ten into two. Moses had established the first great commandment when he wrote, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Dut. 6 5. So Jesus added only, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Mark 12 31, to that first great commandment. These laws of God were so powerful and eternal that Jesus quoted them to refute the temptations of the devil. Compare Matt. 4 3 to 10 and Dut. 6 13 8 3. Then the devil quoted scripture in return to support his temptation. Matt. 4 6. Then for a third time, Jesus quoted the writings of Moses to discourage and rebuke the tempter. Moses knew that if the children of Israel would live the laws of God, they would soon gain a testimony of God because living spiritual laws convinces men of spiritual things. Moses was attempting to bring them to a knowledge of their Messiah. He introduced this Messiah by saying that there shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Num. 24 17, again he wrote that the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him, ye shall hearken. Dut. 1815, Paul the Apostle quoted this passage to the Jews to convince them that he was speaking of Christ. Acts 737 38.
So similar were the lives of Moses and Christ, that the resemblance cannot be refuted. Everything in the life and teachings of Moses pointed so forcefully to Christ and his life as the Messiah that Jesus said, Had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. John 5 46. T h e b r a z e n s e r p e n t. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beholdeth the serpent of brass, he lived. Numbers 21 8, 9. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3 14-15. Picture of Caduceus, emblem of medicine. The Army Medical Corps has adopted this emblem based upon legendary mythology, and is considered as a symbol and a tribute of the Greek god Hermes and the Roman god Mercury.